That's almost double the number from two years ago. While well over half of the country's 240 million people live with some degree of food insecurity. With the economy slowing and inflation soaring, the challenge, as Lula says, is immense. One major campaign promise is to curb deforestation in the Amazon. We're going to reinstate vigilant monitoring of the Amazon and fight against any illegal mining of minerals, lumber extraction or land clearing for agriculture. At the same time, we're going to promote sustainable development in communities there. We are going to prove once again that it's possible to generate wealth without destroying the environment. The president-to-be has won by the smallest margin since the end of the dictatorship in 1985. Legislative elections have left him with strong opposition in Congress, which is set to disturb his attempts to bring about change. At least 134 people, most of them women and children, were killed in the collapse of a suspension bridge in India on Sunday. That bridge over the Machu River is a popular tourist spot that just reopened last week after months of repairs. The bridge was meant to hold about 100 people, but more than four times that amount were gathered on and around it for a New Year's celebration at the time. Navadita Kumari gave us more details from New Delhi. There are still multiple boats on the river. Uh, they are uh, searching for the missing people. What we know is that uh, this hanging bridge was at least 140 years old and was closed for at least seven months and uh, just opened five days ago uh, to the public. Um, and the carrying capacity of the bridge uh, is supposed to be 100, between 100 to 150. But at the time of collapse, there were over 400 people and um, they had gathered there for the festival of Chhat Puja, and because of the overcrowding, it is believed that uh, uh, the bridge collapsed. Uh, most of the victims uh, are believed to be women and children. Um, and the cause of the death, as we know that the bridge was quite high, when it broke, people fell on each other and many became um, un unconscious and drowned quickly. And also the rescue teams arrived uh, two hours after this incident, which also led to the high death toll. The local authorities are blaming the private company which did the repair work. Uh, they said that the company did not have the required fitness certificates uh, to reopen the bridge uh, and it, uh, the company decided on its own to reopen it to the public. But uh, victims' families are not convinced with this argument. They are shocked and they are questioning the local uh, administration. Uh, they are saying that how can a public place be opened and could be operated without the knowledge of local administration. They there are still many people waiting at the collapse site and many outside hospitals where uh, injured people have been taken. Meanwhile, South Korea has begun six days of national mourning after a crowd crush in Seoul left 154 dead over the weekend. The mostly young victims had gathered for Halloween festivities at the time, as Peter Hutt Sierra explains. One day after a massive Halloween celebration ended in a deadly stampede, South Koreans are searching for answers. President Yoon suk yeol has declared a period of national mourning and has pledged that the government will carry out a thorough investigation. A tragedy and disaster that should not have happened took place in the heart of Seoul during Halloween celebrations last night. I express my condolences to the victims of the unexpected incident and hope the people who were injured get well soon. The government is still unsure what exactly initiated the tragedy. Revelers were packed into narrow winding streets. Once the crush began, those behind them pressed forward unknowingly. Paramedics on the scene were overwhelmed by the huge crowd and the number of victims. There were just too many people and you, you couldn't even move. There will be a lot of questions raised later on as to why there was absolutely no crowd control. Authorities deny that a bigger security presence would have made a difference. It was not a problem that could have been solved by deploying police or firefighters in advance. Also, as you know well, yesterday there were various disturbances and protests in downtown Seoul, so police troops were dispersed to these places. This was the first Halloween without COVID-19 restrictions in three years. 
for many young people, an opportunity to let off steam after years of confinement. In Somalia, the death toll from twin car bombings in the capital Mogadishu has risen to 100. Al-Shabaab Islamists linked to al-Qaeda say they were behind the attacks Saturday that left 300 more hurt. Al-Shabaab has been trying to overthrow the fragile foreign-backed government in Mogadishu for the past 15 years. Now, Ukraine says it was hit by more than 50 Russian cruise missiles this morning, causing power cuts across the country. Those strikes came after Moscow blamed Kyiv for an attack on its Black Sea fleet and pulled out of a deal allowing Ukrainian grain shipments. Russia's weekend backtrack from that U.N. brokered deal to export Black Sea grains is likely to hit shipments to countries dependent on imports, deepening a global food crisis and increasing prices. Oliver Ferry reports. The 16 ships, 12 of which are sailing out of Ukrainian ports, are set to be given a safe corridor on Monday after an agreement announced by the United Nations, Ukraine and Turkey. Moscow had announced on Saturday it was suspending its involvement in the UN broker June deal following attacks on its fleet in Russian annexed Crimea. The resumption of a Russian blockade of Ukrainian ports has once again threatened another wave of food insecurity for many countries. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Russia was holding the world to ransom. We're ready to release this vessel into the sea, like all others that left the ports of Greater Odessa during the Grain Export Initiative. But this bulker with wheat for the UN food programme and other vessels with agricultural products are forced to wait because Russia is blackmailing the world with hunger. Food exports from Ukraine, which is one of the world's top five grain producers, have been severely hit ever since Russia's invasion in February this year. Wheat prices rose 5.5 per cent and corn 2 per cent upon the market's opening on Monday, as concerns over global grain supplies mounted. Lebanese President Michel Aoun has left the presidential palace one day before his mandate was due to expire. He leaves office without a designated successor, deepening the country's already chaotic political crisis. Aoun's six-year term was marred by mass protests, a painful economic downturn, and the August 2020 mass explosion of ammonium nitrate that killed hundreds and laid waste to large parts of Beirut. In order for the country to live, it will need reforms and should punish the influential people who paralyzed the judiciary and stopped the criminal investigation regarding the port. Well, in the United States, the midterm elections are just over a week away. That vote halfway through a president's term is often seen as a referendum on the party in power. The different elections will determine whether the Democrats keep their slim majorities in the House and Senate. Our France 24 team has been traveling around the states, examining some of the key issues that are shaping the minds of voters this time around. Today, they take us to Minneapolis with a spotlight on police brutality. This from Ketha Van Gorgistani and Fanny Allard. In May 2020, Minneapolis became the symbol of police violence in the U.S. following the murder of George Floyd at the hands of a white officer. Since then, at least four other unarmed black men from the Minneapolis area have been killed by police. Among them, 20-year-old Dante Wright, who was shot and killed during a traffic stop in April 2021. See, he was light-skinned and he still got profiled by the police. Never in a million years thought that something like this would happen to us. We're not gangsters or doing bad to people. We're decent people. This wasn't supposed to happen to us. When Wright tried to get away from officers, Kim Potter, a 26-year veteran of the police force, fatally shot him. The officer, who claimed she mistook her gun for a taser, was found guilty of manslaughter. There definitely is a problem with the way the, po the, the police are trained, with the way the system works. If my son had blonde hair and blue eyes, he probably would still be living today. Since 2020, about a third of Minneapolis's police officers have left the force. The police department has made changes, unarmed patrols, shorter working hours, and a focus on regaining the trust of the community. I've been very intentional in reaching out to communities because a lot of them don't know us. They see the uniform. 
So when they see the uniform, they think of what happened on that May in 2020, but that's not like all of us, like we're people too. Earlier this year, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights released a scathing report showing the Minneapolis Police Department had a pattern of racial discrimination. When that came out, that bothers me. That it says that we have a pattern of discrimination. From what I see here and what these officers are doing, what I'm doing, yeah, I mean, th th there is that incident. There, we have some history. I, I understand that, but um, I don't believe, personally, I don't believe that's us, and that, that's not what we're trying to do. In May, Joe Biden signed an executive order directing federal law enforcement agencies to revise use of force policies. With one major flaw, according to critics, it does not apply to the country's 18,000 state and local agencies. Joe Biden came in off the energy of the Black Lives Matter movement. He met with George Floyd's family, but he still hasn't passed meaningful police accountability uh, legislation. They need black men to come out and vote. Well, black men are saying we need economic justice and we need the police to stop killing us. So if you can ensure that, then we can vote for you. If not, we're going to look in a different direction. Despite making up 13 percent of the population, blacks still represent 25 percent of those killed by the police this year, a disparity that could cost Democrats part of the crucial black vote. You are watching France 24. Stay with us. It's the world seen from Paris. Hi, everyone. I'm Francois Picard. Join us for the France 24 debate, the crossroads between different perspectives, rival interests, and your feedback. Only on France 24 and France24.com. Welcome to France 24's weekly music show. Our guest this week broke into the world of DJing and clubbing when she was just a teenager. At the time, she would play around with software and upload her music to the platform SoundCloud while DJing ballrooms in Amsterdam. Her airy vocals and blasé flow on ever-shifting pop-orientated electronica struck a chord with clubbers. In the space of six years, she released a number of EPs and has just dropped Mosquito, a deep bass and tempo-varied mixtape on prestigious electronic label. Ninja Tunes, Lisa Da Silva, a.k.a. Liza. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure having you. Now, you are uh, Brazilian, but you live in the Netherlands, and uh, obviously the uh, presidential elections took place uh, this weekend in Brazil with uh, Lula gaining <laughs> close to 51% of, uh, of the vote. How does it feel? I am so, so, so happy that Lula got re-elected. Um, I think it's a really, really great step for just kind of like trying to go towards a level of equality uh, within Brazil and obviously LGBTQ plus rights, um, just indigenous rights. I'm just very excited to see what he can do in, the, in this new presidency. Mm. And now you're uh, 23 and you moved to the Netherlands a decade ago. Right. What was that like, that shift? Um, it was quite a culture clash. Obviously, Europe is different than uh, South America, but I'm just so happy that my mom made this choice for us because I feel like it just really opened a whole new world of possibilities for me. And obviously, being able to make music, I feel like that's not really a thing that's as accessible to um, just Brazilian or people from the third world. And I'm really happy that now I kind of, uh, with Mosquito, have had a possibility to kind of bridge that gap between... Um, yeah, the global south and Europe. Mm. And now uh, Brazil is such a huge country, geographically speaking, but also it's a melting pot uh, right. culturally, and your music is uh, quite a melting pot itself. Uh, you chose uh, to call your mixtape Mosquito, which is not everyone's favourite little beastie flying around. Yeah. Why did you go for that? Um, I thought it was just quite a nice representation of um, just how I was feeling at the moment, just like how I kind of felt like I was this kind of annoying little presence in the music industry, but that a lot of people were quite like... 
I don't know, I was like just still at the same time like taking up quite a lot of space and I then realized that a lot of people just feel quite misunderstood in their day-to-day -day life, like outside of identity, outside of gender, sexuality. And I was like, wow, I think everyone kind of feels like a mosquito sometimes in a room. And I kind of wanted to find a way to communicate within those differences. And I think just kind of finding like a muse and this like unlikely <laughs> insect was just like a really great way of me being able to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, how about we check out one of the tracks, Deserve It, featuring Spanish trap artist Zoe. Great track there. Now you sing in English and Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, do you have any particular relationship with each language? And if so, can you tell us more? Well, obviously I was born in Brazil, so Portuguese is my first language. And then English, I think, is just such a great way of communicating with people because it's such a widely spoken language. And then Spanish has been something that from also just touring with Zoe quite a bit. And then it's kind of in between, I feel both. It's kind of like this level that sits between, I think a lot of English speaking people know and understand Spanish or have been around it for quite a while. So I think being able to kind of connect to Brazilian and the, the Portuguese, like Spanish, like a really nice kind of in between way. Um, but I think it's just quite nice being able to communicate with people in different languages and I feel like you kind of tap into different, yeah, just different people um, by also facilitating like that use of language within your music. Mm -hmm. um, now you've name checked Nicki Minaj uh, as one of your inspirations uh, for the way she bridges rap, electronic dance music, um, yeah. also pop. Uh, what was it that made her a pioneer in your eyes? I don't know. I think she's just so iconic in the way that she just really tried to push against boundaries. And I think a lot of, um, at the time, a lot of black women were kind of being pushed into a certain genre. And Nicki Minaj just really came through with this like pop, electro, like electronic album and was working with David Guetta and like doing all these crazy videos. And I think it just really opened up a lot um, of possibilities for like black women within music to realize that they don't necessarily have to stick only to rap or R&B or soul, but that there's like this whole world of possibilities that we can like tap into. And I think like even looking around to this day, there's so many black women in electronic music, but also rap that just really kind of cite Nicki Minaj as such like an inspiration. So. Mm. And I want to talk about your image as well, like notably on the cover of your album. Tell us what, what drew you to having this position of you're kind of walking on yourself because I imagine it's your feet yeah. on it with the long nails. Yeah. Uh, how did you come up with the idea? Um, I actually did it together with this collective, Limitrofe Television, who's like a collective that I'm really close to. Uh, with Anuncia's Dromos, uh, P. Ferreira, Scopetta Shepherd. Um, and we just kind of like thought about this idea of, you know, kind of killing this uncomfortability within yourself and kind of like, I guess this is like the next step of me like kind of killing this idea that maybe I take up too much space or maybe killing this idea that I'm this annoying insect. And now I guess it's like onto the next step of like stepping closer to myself. Mm -hmm. and kind of letting go of this mosquito mentality. Yeah, no. And it's really fun that you were able to reconnect with this record too. Back to back to Brazil, mm -hmm. you know, and filming videos there. Um, what's up next for you? What's up next? Uh, I'm working on a really cool um, exposition with Gabriel Massan, who's like a 3D artist. Um, we're working on a video game, oh, cool. wow. <laughs> which I'm really excited about. Um, I think within my work, I really try to kind of create new worlds for people to kind of create new narratives and um, yeah, try to like bring bring forward new voices within art and music and I think a video game is such a nice kind of like step to really creating this new world. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have some new music coming out with Big Data, my label, and then I'm touring currently. I'm going to be in Toulouse on the 26th Seven. of yeah. November. 
Um, and then in London on the 15th of December. So, yeah. Definitely just... want to check it.